Joining me in the studio today is Professor John Hodges and Christine Bryden. What brings you into Neuro today, Christine? Oh, for my checkup, regular sort of checking up on my condition. Yeah. How did the two of you come to meet? Oh, that was through you who are. It was. Sure. However you pronounce it. Yes. Yeah. How did she know you? Well, she just, I'd, I'd moved to Australia in 2007, and uh, she made contact with me and said, you know, she had this patient that, you know, she got involved with and was making a, a documentary, and would I like to participate? And I was open to doing new things, yeah. and um, sounded quite interesting coming up to Queensland. Yeah. So we came up together and visited you at home. And it was hot. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was hot and sticky that whole time. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I did a few assessments, yeah. but you know, didn't bring much with me. And um, then we arranged for you to have that um, scan in Melbourne. That was the oh, next thing. Oh, that's right. Because that's the outside of scan, thing, yeah. which was negative. So it showed that it must be something different. It must be something else. And then I saw you back here um, about three years ago. You came down and had a full assessment and a scan. Yeah. So, in terms of all these various conditions that there are yeah. for the brain, I yes. mean, I've got lots of brain missing. I yes. think I'm Freddie can see that. Yeah. If it's not Alzheimer's, yeah. is well, it frontotemporal dementia? Well, and how many types are there? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, um, you don't fit that there are these international criteria for frontotemporal dementia. You mean the DSM-5? No, no, these are sort of international no guidelines that uh, you know, yeah, neurologists right. around the world yeah. apply now, um, that I was involved in developing ah. them. And to say that somebody has frontotemporal dementia, you have to have a certain number of key clinical features and there has to be either sort of major changes in personality with certain features or problems, significant problems with knowing the meanings of words and that type of thing. So you don't fit the criteria for frontotemporal dementia. But from my own uh, experience, yeah. I've had a major change in personality Yes. Since the beginning. Sure. But they're not, I don't want to implant things that you don't have, but you don't have the features that are okay. typical no, of no. frontotemporal dementia. No. Um, um, and, but, you know, our diagnosis of brain conditions is still rather inexact. Yeah. We've developed these criteria, and, you know, when we say in life, somebody has frontotemporal dementia and we follow them up and eventually look at their brain, the, the vast majority of those people do have mm. frontotemporal mm. dementia. A few have other weird and wonderful conditions. And the pathology of frontotemporal dementia, we occasionally find in people that we didn't think that was the diagnosis mm. in life. But in addition, there are a lot of other rare disorders that can affect the brain. And uh, some of them we can diagnose now in life with imaging, bloods, those sort of things. But some of these diseases we still can't diagnose mm -hmm. in life. So in Cambridge, we had people we followed up. Um, you know, they had a dementia. We didn't quite know what sort it was when they died. The pathology of the brain was a kind of really rare disease that you know you can only diagnose pathologically. So we mm. we still can't diagnose every kind of brain disease in when yes. people are alive. So what you're saying is that there's quite a n number of brain diseases. Yeah. And we've sort of lumped a few things together yeah. in various categories, yeah. but I'm sort of on the yeah. fringes somewhere. But you don't there. fit the. And also um, the longevity of your problems, yeah. the fact you were diagnosed 20 years ago mm -hmm. now and, and doing, you know, not too mm -hmm. badly, that's really right at the, I know I've never seen anybody mm -hmm. 
anything doing nearly as well as you are yeah. with um, frontotemporal dementia because usually when people present with that um, you know within five to ten years they're incapacitated mm -hmm. no matter how hard they mm -hmm. try so that also suggests to me something else. that's something else that we don't really know what it is with the pattern of my brain damage, yeah. I just want to get to that really yeah. because I find it really interesting. Mm. You know, people say, oh, this bit of the brain does that, and this yeah. bit of the brain does that. Sure. Well, it looks like temporal lobes are sort of gone all little. No, temporal lobes mm. aren't too bad. Oh, okay. No, the temporal lobes are not too bad. Um, I think um, the main problem, the main symptoms mm. you have which fit in with the scan is that it's more about connectivity between areas, mm. uh, that you know there are different bits of the brain that do particular things, you know, memory, language, vision, solve problems, but they have to communicate together and uh, mental speed uh, depends on the sort of coordination of these areas. There isn't an area for mental speed. It's that's to do with how quickly the different areas communicate with each other. I could be a lot worse if I didn't yeah. have the exon the, yeah. the medication. I imagine so. Um, so I would think that the problem most of the problems that you've got don't reflect focal pathology okay. of to one bit. It's a rather generalised process, and most of those areas are not doing too badly. But the difficulty is when one has to communicate quickly with another. Because it's all shrinking slowly, yeah. and it's all getting a bit. Yeah. Is one lobe more affected than the other? Um, and if so, which one? Not too much. I mean, um, the left is perhaps slightly worse than the right. And the, the left's more verbal, and um, the um, right side of the brain is more visual. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the sort of, you know, the front end and the back end both look, you know, smaller than they should be. Mm. Um, so it's a fairly diffuse, generalised process. Do you think there might have been a Pathogen or something. Oh, they did test my yeah. a bug. Um, a bacteria yeah, and they didn't actually test my the lumber puncher. They did that yeah. in the beginning, and we tested for um, disease. And yes. I mean, well, you haven't got the pattern of brain disease that fits with any known infection mm -hmm. of the, of the mm -hmm. brain. So. It's hard if you don't know exactly what is wrong with somebody mm. to be too dogmatic and say, well, it can't be this and it can't be the other. Um, but there aren't any pathogens we know that cause this. Mm. So I just need to keep lasting long enough right. until you find it. <laughs> uh, Christine, for people that haven't heard your story, can mm. you tell us about when you were first diagnosed? Well, I used to be very high level at work very capable, super memory, lateral thinking, all of that. Um, so this was in Canberra, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, science and technology advisor to the Prime Minister. But I was having big migra migraines every week or week. So I went to see doctors about that. And then I had a CAT scan and that showed some generalised atrophy. No other problem generalised brain shrinkage, and um, and I went to a neurologist. Um, I must have had, I can't quite recall, but I must have had further tests and then an MRI, and that's when they diagnosed mm. me originally with Alzheimer's disease. Because you had some psychology tests. Yeah, I had neuropsychology tests. Yeah, you had neuropsychology tests, tests in that's camera. Right. That's right. And then I got put onto the very first anti-dementia medication. Mm. But then I had follow-ups every six months and then every year, having more MRI scans, more neuropsych tests. Mm -hmm. So I've done them quite a lot. Um, 
And then in 1998, there was a PET scan, a, a coloured thing, a run mm. emission tomography, to show how the brain's functioning, not just what it, mm. what structure is. Um, but that also, the pattern there was more like frontal and temporal lobe. So then mm. there was that re-diagnosis back then. Mm. But it was glacially slow, is what I was told. So I just mm. kept on going, and I've mm. just kept on going ever since, taking mm. medication and trying to keep active. Um, and my brain working as best it can. And why did you decide to start speaking out about dementia? Ah, yes, I remember that. In 1996, there were some jokes in the newspaper about Ronald Reagan. Um, so I wrote to the newspaper quite irate about that, about jokes about Alzheimer's disease. I thought that was just not right. Why would you joke about it? You don't joke about other diseases, why well, joke about dementia? So then I got onto a TV show. You know, they did a documentary thing. And then I was writing my book. And just, it just sort of escalated from there, really, because I just got passionate that people with dementia were either laughed at or ignored. It's just stigma about having dementia. And it's just a disease, and I just felt annoyed that that was the case. Um, and I felt that we didn't have a voice, and nobody was speaking up for us, and we weren't speaking up for ourselves, because it's really hard. When you speak out about it, people say, oh, there's nothing wrong with you, because you can speak. Um, it's like a catch-22. John, why do you think Christine's story might be important for the broader medical community? Well, you know, I think I um, agree with Christine that, um, you know, compared to cancer and other conditions, and some conditions that are, you know, much, much rarer, get a lot of publicity and sympathy and money for research. So anything that really puts dementia mm -hmm. in the public eye and raises awareness and and therefore, you know, helps individuals with the diagnosis, um, but it also helps medical researchers, Absolutely. you know, with gaining more prominence and funds. Absolutely, because I sometimes I try to get some figures for breast cancer versus younger mm. onset dementia, yeah. and there's actually more cases of younger onset dementia, and yet the profile gives you the other yes. impression that there's hardly any of us, you know, people with mm. young onset dementia. And then when you look at the NH and MRC funding, it's out of whack with the number of cases of mm. various diseases. Mm. Why do you Different think that might be? Mm. Um, dementia is not a sexy topic, I think. Mm. I, I don't know why. Well, seen as part of ageing. Probably the lack of curative therapies so far has been a, a factor. Um, as soon as we come up with drugs that are a bit more kind of curative, then I think the profile will change. Um, but people still have to be managed and looked after even if we can't cure it. Speaking of looking after, how important is the neurologist-patient relationship? Very important, very important. To me, it validates me as a person with a disease, with a condition, mm. because without that, nobody believes there's anything wrong. It's really, it's really um, difficult. It's a real struggle, and then you can and you can feel encouraged as you keep coming to visit. You feel more encouraged to just keep trying your best to do mm. what you can, and you also feel in touch with what's happening. You know whether there's going to ever be. A, a, a treatment either to slow the thing down or stop it altogether. Mm. Has Christine's story changed you at all <laughs> as a scientist? Um, well, um, you know, medicine, I've been you know, involved with medicine a long time, so I've obviously seen a lot of unusual and remarkable people. Um, Christine's case is remarkable. Um, you know, we most of the patients we see we can fit into 
in one category or another. So um, it's sort of exceptional um, now to have somebody that you can't really sort of diagnose quite so accurately as we'd like, uh, and to have somebody that's done so well, um, you know, their changes are so slow and gradual over a long period. So um, it just shows me that when if we diagnose patients, we need to be a bit circumspect about the prognosis. Um, you know, so everybody, you know, gives some hope that individuals might be in the very slow track. I think it's very important to give hope at the beginning. Yeah. Because there used to be a tendency towards the mm. five years to you're totally demented, three years mm. in a nursing home, then you're dead mm. type of prognosis yeah. mm -hmm. that I was originally given. Um, and it certainly strips you of hope. Uh, I always say everybody is a unique individual. The brain is unique to each one of us. The pathology is probably unique to each mm. one of us. You know, mm. you might be able to categorise a condition, a bucket yeah. of conditions, as FTD or whatever, but there's variations within that. Yeah. So everybody is going to just have to live sure. each day at a time and enjoy it every day. So you need to get a balanced view, because mm. the other criticism, though, is of doctors who can don't say, to say anything mm. about the prognosis mm. and people don't make any plans for the mm. future. So you need to get the balance and say, well, most people with this do decline, mm. but the rate at which they decline, and um, you know, we always withhold judgment about how fast somebody is going to decline until we've seen them a couple of times, and then it becomes very clear that somebody's you know, in a very slow track or a fast track. I certainly think people should get their affairs in order yes. when they're diagnosed with dementia. I think it's important to mm. have a will, mm. have um, you know, advanced directors or whatever you might yeah. want to put in place, because you don't know how long you can still sign sign or add up or all those things. Mm. You need to get your affairs in order but not do that as a sort of last act mm. and then give up all hope. But to get your affairs in order in terms of taking control of your own life. Mm. And speaking of the future, what is the next chapter for you, do you think? Oh, I'd love to just rest. <laughs> um, now I've got to keep trying because if I gave up I think I would not do as well. So I just keep going, but maybe not quite so frenetically. I'm looking forward to a bit of a break next year. Um, yeah. Okay, well, good luck, and thank, thank you. you very much for coming into the Neuro thank Studio. You. It's so good to see you, Christine and Professor John Hodges. Thank you. Bye.